today uh, because today is uh, uh, the month when we celebrate uh, uh, Valentine's Day. So I thought uh, the, the most suitable topic would be to talk about love in ancient Egypt in general, particularly uh, uh, love upon the throne. So we're going to touch a couple of uh, things uh, uh, related to the royal families in ancient Egypt or through history and also uh, love, the concept of love in general uh, during uh, the time of ancient Egypt. Um, actually, I give the, the, the lecture a name uh, before using this name, love upon the throne, which is the ancient Egyptian Valentine. But I said Valentine is much later than the ancient Egyptian, so I changed again to uh, uh, love upon the throne. Uh, to understand actually uh, uh, the concept of love in ancient Egypt, we need to go back into the mythology uh, uh, of ancient Egypt. So I got this chart, which is explaining. Is it mine? Uh, I'm this, sorry, I thought it was you, I was looking at you. <laughs> this chart is, is uh, giving us an idea about the beginning of creation in ancient Egypt, that they believed that Ra was the creator, the god Ra, uh, who was the sun god, was the creator, and from the god Ra we had two gods. One of them was god Shu, and the other one was goddess Tifnut. Gotshu was the god of air, and uh, 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 goddess uh, Tifnut was his wife. Uh, when they got married, they had uh, uh, two children, Geb and Nut. Geb was the god of earth, and Nut was the goddess of sky. Again, when Geb and Nut were married, they had four children, two boys and two girls. We find that this uh, uh, story is quite similar uh, to the story uh, of Adam and Eve and the four children uh, uh, we know very well, uh, Cain and Abel and so on. These are the pictures of the gods. The god Ra is on top, got like a figure of a falcon-headed god with the sword that's on top of his head. Shu and Tifnut, Geb and Nut, and here you can see this is the very common figure of Geb and Nut. This one here, this lady stretching her body, uh, touching earth from one side with her hands, from the other side with her feet, while her husband, God Geb, is laying down on the floor. And she has the figure of the dark sky, dark navy blue sky with the stars. Here another picture from the tombs in the valley of the kings. And this one is even uh, better because we can see a man like standing as if he's holding or lifting the body of goddess Nut, trying to split her up from her husband, God Geb, who's laying down on the floor. So the legend is telling us that when they were attached to each other, forming like one body at the beginning of creation, and then splitting them by God Shu to create a space in between the two of them, uh, they were uh, married and they had four children. This splitting of God's mood and God Geb, we can call it the Big Bang, for example, yeah, in the modern terms. So they had the four children, Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. So, because they were the first four semi-gods or semi-humans, they got married to each other, forming the first two couples. Osiris married Isis, Seth married Nephthys. Okay? Here we can see some pictures of Isis and Osiris. Isis is always shown in the form of a lady, beautiful lady, with uh, the throne on the top of her head. By the way, the name Isis originally was Iset, later Isis. Isis means the throne. That's why you can see always the throne on the top of her head or in front of her face. While Osiris will always be shown in the form of a mummy, and we'll find out why. Also, the color of his skin is either dark 
blue or dark green or black, which is the color of the human body after death and mainly after mummification and the rehydration of the body. What happened to that company? Because we have here two brothers was kind of jealousy for a reason or another between the two brothers. This guy was an evil guy, Seth, who thought about getting rid of his good brother, Osiris. Very briefly, I'm not going into the legend of Isomzaris, which is, in my opinion, is the core and the heart of the Egyptian mythology. If we really understand the legend, we can easily understand most of the things we, we see, either in tombs or temples and museums, either in Egypt or worldwide. And it will explain a lot about what happened later on concerning the royal families and dynasties and so on. So Seth, the evil one, thought of killing uh, or getting rid of his brother, the good brother, Osiris. How to kill him? The legend said that he designed a coffin or a sarcophagus using the measurements of his brother Osiris, inviting everybody to a nice party, claiming that he would like to be a good brother, asking them to try the sarcophagus. And he said, if it fits one of you, he or she will take it as a gift. Oh, wait a minute. You are invited to a party and your host is asking you to try the coffin, and if you like it or if it fits you, take it. It's yours. Maybe it's not nice to us when we think about it today, but to them it was a good gift. Why? Because they focused more on the afterlife. They knew from the beginning that this life, this first life, is a short period of time and sooner or later will come to an end. Yeah? So they were focusing on the afterlife or life after death or the second life or whatever you like. So offering someone a coffin or a sarcophagus as if you are wishing him a better life in the year after. Because it was designed and made specially for Osiris, so it fits Osiris, so Osiris was, was very happy. While he was trying the coffin or the sarcophagus, the evil brother says, covered the sarcophagus with the heavy lid, pushed in the water, the Nile took it far away and disappeared. To cut the long story short, Isis, because of the love she had in her heart towards her husband, she went looking for this sarcophagus. She found it, but of course he was dead. She's been advised by the God to do the mummification, to keep the body in good condition for the afterlife. She was assisted by another God called Anubis, and she did the mummification, put the mummy safe somewhere in the delta, in the marsh of the delta, and she was visiting the tomb every now and then. Seth, the evil one, was hunting one day when he found the sarcophagus contains the body or the mummy of Osiris. He said, ah, if I leave it like this, then my brother will come back to the afterlife in good shape, in good condition. Then I will be punished for killing him. What should I do? I have to destroy the body to destroy his journey to the afterlife. It's part of the belief that you have to keep the body in good condition, you have to keep the body in good condition for the afterlife. This is why they did the mummification, this is why they built the tomb and put everything they need in the tomb so they can use it in the afterlife. Anyway, he got, got a sharp knife, he started chopping the body in pieces, scattering them far and wide all over the country. We are not into the debate how many pieces they were because some of them said 14, some said 16, 42. 42 is a very political number. Why? Because Egypt originally was divided into 42 provinces or 42 states. Yeah? Anyway, I would go for 14 or 16 even. Anyway, Isis went to visit the tomb one day, empty, nothing. What happened? God told her the story. What should I do now? He need to. Uh, go and look for the members of the body. She went to look for the members, found them all except one, his manhood, which was thrown in, in the river and the fish ate it, to make sure that Osiris will never have children. Okay, this is very important. So here when we look at the picture, 
this is drawing from originally this scene originally is in a beautiful and famous temple in Upper Egypt, which is the temple of Abydos. Abydos is locate, located to the north of Luxor, hmm? about let's say two hours drive from Luxor. One of the most beautiful temples in the whole of Egypt. The temple was originally built by King Siti the first, and was completed or added to by his son Ramesses the second. Beautiful painting, beautiful carving. I have some pictures from this temple coming to see uh, later on. So the scene here shows Osiris laying down on the mummification table like a mummy. And in this scene we find Isis in the form of a bird flying over his body to receive his seeds so she can give him uh, give birth to uh, their son Horus later on. This is the original scene, maybe it's not very good. This one actually is the same scene, but this is from the Temple of Dendera. Also the Temple of Dendera, north of Luxor. It's another amazing, beautiful Greco-Roman temple. This is a pharaonic temple, this is a Greco-Roman temple, but it's more or less similar scene. So, after that moment, uh, uh, she had the child uh, Horus and uh, Horus would become a very important god in ancient Egypt because all the kings sitting upon the throne ruling the country they were representing Horus so the king went, while he was alive he was Horus when he is dead he will become the form of Osiris Horus' father so the king when he was alive he was Horus when he is dead he will become Osiris I got you also three pictures uh, from the famous and the beautiful temple of uh, Philae, uh, uh, dedicated to goddess Isis, uh, Philae in Aswan, which is another beautiful uh, temple. Not just the temple is beautiful, but also its unique uh, location. Back to talk about the different members of the body. I told you about the temple of Abydos. Abydos Actually, originally, the word was Abidju, which means the place of the head. Believe that the head of Osiris was found there, which turned to be the main center for the cult of God Osiris. And the temple of Osiris there in Abydos was the main temple where all the kings, after being mummified, they should do a pilgrimage trip to Abydos for the final procession before they in, in, in the tomb. Uh, if you've been to the pyramids of Giza, uh, I'm sure that you haven't missed visiting the Solar Boat Museum. Yeah? It is strongly believed now that the Solar Boat shouldn't be called the Solar Boat. Yeah? Because we thought at the beginning when it was discovered in the 50s by Professor Kamal Malek in 1954 that it was designed for the king to use in the afterlife, to travel with the, the, the sun in the sky during the 12 hours of the day. But when they examined the wood, they realized that the, the boat was used in water, either once or more. So we had a, a debate. Have they used it when the king was alive and it's part of his furniture? That's why it was dismantled and buried so the king can use it in the afterlife. Makes sense. But some uh, Egyptologists believe that it was used once when the king died, mummified, and they had to take the mummy down to Abydos for the final procession and the final visit to the god Osiris, as if they are informing god Osiris, the god of the year after, who will become later on the one in charge of judging humans by weighing their heart and the feather to decide either they were good or bad and either send them to hell or to heaven according to what they've done, okay? So they are informing God Osiris that you're the king, your representative is dead now and soon he will join you, please guide him to heaven. So here you can see, if you, if you look carefully at this uh, picture, you find a crocodile and there is something on the top of the crocodile believed to be the left leg of Osiris. So they claim that one of the members of the body was found in the area where now they have the Temple of Fila. Okay, here this scene actually, but here it's bigger, 
This is goddess Isis, and we can see the rocks next to goddess Isis. These are the rocks of the area where we have the island uh, uh, hosting uh, the temple of Philae uh, originally. And uh, here we have the cobra at uh, uh, this section of the picture. And inside the cobra, which is forming like a small circle, we have the figure of the god Habi, the god, the Nile god. While on the top of the rocks, we have uh, the vulture or uh, goddess Nehbet. Wajit was the goddess of Lower Egypt. Nehbet was the goddess of Upper Egypt, representing Upper and Lower Egypt uh, uh, at that time. Here, the complete scene shows Horus the falcon standing uh, uh, on the top of like crops, which is representing the reproduction or the rebirth of the king after death. The king died, became Osiris, and they are expecting the rebirth of the king in the afterlife. Of course, all this story related to Isis and Osiris is because of love. If she hasn't loved him that much, she wouldn't go into the hassle of looking for the body in the first place and then mummifying him. And then when the body was dismantled and scattered everywhere, in Egypt, uh, she wouldn't go into the hassle to look for the members and to collect the gain, and she do all her very best uh, to receive the seeds, to give him the child Horus and all this stuff. These are pictures from the Temple of Abydos again by Seti the First. The king here, is King City, Seti the First. Look at the beautiful pictures. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the carvings and the paintings. Colors are original, by the way, as you may know, that all the colors we have in Egypt, they have been touched. When we do restoration in Egypt, decision being made long time ago not to touch the colors, not to touch the carvings. So everything we see in Egypt, everywhere in Egypt, is original. Even when you go to some of the temples in Upper Egypt, you can tell which part of the scene is being restored, which looks ugly, just plain cement. Yeah, and it looks ugly, but it's good. At least after all this years, you can be sure that what you see is original. Yeah, so the colors are original and the figures are uh, not, not being touched. So what is he doing here? What does he do, Mr. City the First? He's holding like a pillar. This is what we call the Jed Pillar. What is the Jed Pillar? Originally, it is representing the backbone of Osiris. And that act is representing what we call the resurrection of Osiris. Osiris, the dead king, will be resurrected from the dead to become alive again. That's why here you can always see goddess Isis in the form of a lady and she has wings, two wings, always holding the body of her husband, Osiris. And if you go to the Egyptian museum, for example, you find many of the coffins and the sarcophagi, they have two female figures. It's quite obvious among the collection from the tomb of Tutankhamen. Uh, the two ladies, one of them would be Isis, the other one would be her sister, Niftis, because they tend to be like birds flying all over everywhere in Egypt, looking for the members of the body of Osiris. And since they are holding the body to protect it uh, from uh, the evil god uh, uh, Ses. <coughs> After giving you this little introduction about the original love story in ancient Egypt between Isis and Osiris, which in my opinion actually one of the most amazing uh, uh, legends in ancient Egypt, uh, we talk about the real stories of the pharaohs. So I got you three pictures of three pyramids. The top one is what we call the, 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 the pyramid of Maidum, which is uh, about an hour and a half drive uh, from Cairo. Uh, I got you this picture because of the story behind the building of that pyramid. This pyramid was originally built by and for a pharaoh called 
Huni. Huni, it seems that he had daughters. He didn't have sons. So one of his daughters got married to a guy. This guy, his name was Senefro. Huni died before he finished his pyramid. So Senefro, when he became the pharaoh, because he was the son-in-law of Huni, wanted to reflect the love between him and his wife by respecting her father and trying to finish the unfinished work and finished the pyramid of King Huni, which is now known as the Pyramid of Maidun, while he was working on his own pyramid. And I got two pictures of the two pyramids. Why two pyramids? Because he started building his first one and it seems that they made a mistake with the angle used for building the pyramid and they tend to change it towards the top so it looks quite odd as you can see not like the pyramids by the way this is what we call the red pyramid and it is uh, uh, a matter of fact the first complete pyramid in egypt it looks very much like the one of giza king uh, hofo or cheops <coughs> but it is the one located do you know where? Not you, of course. <laughs> the, the two pyramids. Dashur. Dashur, thank you very much. That's in Dashur, which was, this area actually, Dashur was closed for many years as a military region, but was open, I think, about maybe 10, 12 years ago. So if you haven't been there, I highly recommend to go and visit the site. And you can actually go inside the Red Pyramid, but definitely don't miss driving near the other one which is uh, like two kilometers far. You can actually see both of them, but you actually drive until you get to this one. Okay, uh, one of my uh, favorite statues... Sorry, and what is the reason uh, of being called the Red Pyramid? Ah, the Red Pyramid because they used like limestone, uh, reddish limestone. So originally it looks like more red like than the other pyramids. Yeah, no, not, not anymore. But was not painted differently yet. Because the decoration of the pyramid, this is a good question, because um, I don't have a picture of, of the pyramids of Giza, but maybe you can imagine what I'm talking about. When they were decorating the pyramids of Giza, they were trying to cover them outside, from outside, with the finer quality of limestone. And that was very practical, because obviously when they were building, they were building from bottom to top, and it seems that they were using huge amount of sand, forming grams, around the pyramids. So when they finish building, the whole thing would be totally buried in sand. So they need to remove the sand from top to bottom this time. While they were doing so, going down, they were covering the pyramids from outside with a finer quality of limestone. And this is very important because the, the, the limestone used for building itself was from the local quarries. Were very practical. They didn't know to go far. They didn't need to go far for the blocks of stones. They used what was available in the area. But for covering them from outside as kind of decoration, they went for the best quality of limestone, which is from a place called Tora. And Tora is not far from Maadi, by the way. It's only a few miles south of here. Yeah? The best quality of limestone in Egypt. Okay. And you can still see still the remains of that uh, 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 um, uh, casing uh, uh, only uh, on the top of the second pyramid <coughs> of Giza. Uh, one of my best uh, uh, favorite statues in the Egyptian museum is the statue of that handsome young man and his beloved wife uh, from the old kingdom collection. Uh, I'm sure that you've all seen it in the Egyptian museum. It's one of the masterpieces. Uh, the guy is called Rahotep and his beloved wife is called Nofrit. Rahotep and Nofrit. And they were members of the fourth dynasty, uh, the kings who built the pyramids. He was the son of Khufu or Cheops, the, built, who, the one who built the great pyramid of Giza. But he was prepared to be a high priest, Rahotep and Nofrit. 
the amazing fact about that couple that Rahotib, when you look at him, he looks very much like men, uh, Egyptian men today. It's very different from the, the other statues of, uh, mm, because most of the statues you see for ancient Egypt, you see them either they have like a wig or a scarf or a crown or something like this. Or if they are not wearing anything, they will have bald heads. So this is very unusual to have a statue of a man with his natural hair yes, and the haircut. Also. Yes, mm -hmm. the haircut is very similar to the haircut of today. Yeah, the today's haircut, and also he got a mustache. <laughs> this is very unusual as well. Of course, we have a number of statues in the Egyptian museum with mustaches and so on, but this is the most uh, 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 beautiful one of them all, and. Uh, you see his beautiful wife, she's wearing the wig, and you can see part of her natural hair on her hair, fr uh, on her hair fr uh, front, and uh, a beautiful makeup, uh, Egyptian, typical Egyptian, ancient Egyptian makeup. She's wearing long transparent robe. Uh, you can see the details of her body. Uh, the only difference between the two of them is not in the size like most people think, because when you we look at the statues, generally when you go to Luxor, for example, you always get this comment from people visiting books for the first time. Ah, guys, you know, look at the statue of Ramesses II and the statue of Nofetari. Look at his size, look at his size, and so on. No, the difference is not in the size. I'm going to talk about Ramesses II later on, but look at the difference here, Mark Green. The only difference is in the color of the skin. They're exactly the same size. There's no difference. Yeah? Um, the, the difference in the color of the skin, why? Because usually men, they are not totally covered like women. Usually women are covered like this. And usually women work indoors. While men are working outdoors, so can easily get the tan. Hmm? I think like today. Yeah, you can find most men, they have a darker skin than uh, females. Right? Uh, there are three pictures here from the tombs in Saqqara. And again, this is one of the most amazing uh, areas you should visit. I think one visit to Saqqara is never enough. Because 10 days and days and days going to Saqqara. Yeah? Uh, uh, one of the famous tombs uh, uh, is called Mary Ruka. Uh, I'm sure if you've been there, I'm sure you've been to that tomb, uh, Mary Ruka. And the next one is called Kagenni. Both of them are beautiful tombs. They still have uh, uh, lovely colors. Um, and when we talk about the tombs in Saqqara, so we talk about like roughly 2300, 2400 BC. So more than 4,000 years old, and you can still see uh, the beauty of the carvings and the paintings survived all these thousands of years. Again, you can see always. The scenes of the man and the woman, equal in size, in love and tender scenes, sitting together listening to music or playing music or watching shows or, or holding flowers or having a drink together. So there is no difference between uh, uh, men and women uh, as shown in all tombs or most tombs and temples all through the Egyptian history. Families. Yeah, I'm, ju I, I'm just trying to give you an idea that it was not just for um, the royal families or for the elite of the society. It was even for everyone, only families. And this uh, statue is from the Egyptian Museum, uh, also the old kingdom. Uh, a wife was married to a dwarf. Look at the beautiful touch. She's holding him very gently and... Uh, 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 here, uh, uh, the artist who made the statue actually uh, got a vision. He said that he, the guy is shorter than the wife, so he can put the boy and the girl, the children here, uh, as if they are replacing his legs. He hadn't lost his legs, but just to have a symmetrical figure together between uh, the, the man and his wife, and also sending a message that maybe the guy is counting on, yeah, relying on his children. Yeah? Uh, 
Now we move from the old kingdom to the new kingdom. Uh, this is a chart showing the beginning of or the birth of the new kingdom or what we will call later on the Egyptian Empire. By the 17th century, uh, uh, sorry, 17th dynasty, Egypt was partly uh, uh, occupied by the Hyksos. But the Hyksos, the foreign rulers, Hekakasut, when they invaded Egypt or when they occupied Egypt, they couldn't control the south. They couldn't control Upper Egypt. So Upper Egypt was partly independent. So we had an Egyptian king ruled from Thebes, Luxor today, and the Hyksos king ruled from Avaris in the Delta. Each one of them claimed that he was the king of the two lands. Okay, so they say. So the Egyptians <coughs> believed that they were the kings of Upper and Lower Egypt. The Hexus believed that they were the kings of Upper and Lower Egypt. Anyway, the one who managed to uh, 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 fight the Hexus and to win the battles against the Hexus and to destroy their army and to uh, 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 achieve uh, uh, the independence of the whole country was King Ames. King Ames was the descendants of a number of kings and queens, and the most famous of them all, the strongest was Queen Titi Shiri. Queen Titi Shiri, his grandmother, and she played a magnificent role in supporting her husband and later her uh, children, sons and grandsons, supporting them strongly with love to achieve the target of fighting the Hyksos and achieving the uh, uh, independence of Egypt. When we talk about the 18th dynasty, it's the family which ruled, which ruled Egypt uh, for quite some times and they had a great achievement. That family includes the most famous names of pharaohs. <coughs> like whom? Do you know the name of that couple? Ramesses. Ramesses. In our opinion. Where is it? It's in the museum, right? It's in the Egyptian museum. Actually you cannot miss it. If you've been to the Egyptian museum you cannot miss it. Yeah? So when you go into the main entrance, <laughs> straight ahead, it will be in front of you. When you go to the upper floor, you can see it from everywhere. Look at the size, yeah? almost reaching the upper floor of the Egyptian museum. Uh, actually, the king was Amun Hotep or Amenophis the third. And uh, 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 excuse me if I mention the name twice, because when I say Amenophis, this is the name you find usually written in most of the guidebooks. But the original name was Amun Hotep. Amun, the god Amun. Hotep means happy or satisfied. But when we say it in the Greek way of pronouncing the name, because we cannot actually, it's like when we talk about uh, Cairo. Do we call it Cairo in Arabic? No. What do we call it? Al Qahira. But because the early travelers to Egypt cannot pronounce the word Al Qahira, so they called it Cairo. Say yeah? it again. Al Qahira. Al Qahira. Yeah. It's not very difficult. <laughs> well, maybe not for you today, but I mean, when they were describing the, the city, it's uh, easier to say Al Qahira. Uh, sorry, Cairo. But, so the same thing when they were trying to pronounce the names of the pharaohs and the names of the gods. I'm talking about the Greek historians, the early Greek travelers to Egypt. They, they pronounce the names mostly in a wrong way. So how was his name from the beginning? Amon Hotep. Oh, Amon Hotep. Yeah. Amon Hotep the third. Yeah. One of the most famous pharaohs ever ruled Egypt. Not just Egypt, he was the king of one of the greatest and largest Egyptian empire. Luxor by his time, Thebes was the city of 100 gates, maybe the largest cosmopolitan city in the ancient world. You can find lots of people living there, studying, working, trading from all over the world, different nationalities. And 
Egyptians were getting married to foreigners was, was very common at the time. Very cosmopolitan like most of European cities like today, London or Paris or whatever. So Amenhotep III was married to uh, Queen T. And again, this just to answer back those who were trying to claim that was always a difference between the king and the queen and the sons. No, this is a very good example. We have many examples coming soon in the, in the rest of the, the slides. They are equal in size. And the size is actually not, not a small size, it's, it's a massive size. Um, queen T was not a member of the royal family. And that was quite odd because they used to get married to members of the royal family most of the time the queen would be the sister of the king or let's say the half sister sometimes to claim that the queen was sitting upon the throne is also a descendant of the gods because they claim that the king was the son of the gods yeah so if He's married to his sister, sitting upon the throne. She's always she, she's also the daughter of the gods. So to get married to someone who's not even a member of the royal family, European royal families, like in the UK, started doing this only very recently. Thirty years ago. Huh? Thirty years ago. Thirty years ago. Yeah. Yes. So, but now when you find uh, 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 the, the, the crown prince of Egypt, well, actually uh, Prince uh, Williams uh, is getting married to uh, someone, a commoner, yeah, you can accept this, you can buy it, because why? You're getting used to it. But 50, 100 years ago, to get married to someone who's not a member of a royal family, it doesn't have to be the, the, the English royal family or the British royal family, they have to look for someone, let's say, the German royal family. Queen Elizabeth is the German queen, actually. Yeah? Or the Spanish royal family, or the French royal family, whatever. So to, to choose someone from the commoners, that was because the great love story between the two of them. Uh, if you're following uh, the, the magazine here of uh, the CSA, uh, I wrote an article. It was due to be uh, on the magazine uh, uh, this month or next month about that couple, um, but for technical problem, we had to change to another uh, uh, subject uh, concerning the next lecture, which is for next month, uh, about the, the evolution of construction. But that, that article will, will come soon uh, in the magazine, so if you, can, if you follow it, then it will be within the coming couple of months. Uh, so Amor Hotel III and Queen T were sitting new rules in ancient Egypt, that the king doesn't have to get married to the member of the royal family. And look at the descendants of that couple. The son of Amenhotep III and Queen T was another Akhenaten, thank you very much, another famous king of Egypt. Uh, Akhenaten, uh, in my opinion, was a genius king. There is always a debate about Akhenaten. Some people said that uh, he was maybe uh, uh, abnormal, he was uh, strange, he was a heretic king, who, whatever. But in my opinion, he was a genius pharaoh. Uh, led a revolution thousands of years ago. The revolution was led by the king who had everything in life, but he wanted to change everything to the best. Changed the religion changed uh, art, changed everything in Egypt. He was definitely supported by a beautiful queen. Queen Nofertiti. Nofertiti. And we have to know the difference between Nofertiti and <coughs> Nofertari. Nofertiti was the wife of Akhenaten, and Nofertari was the wife of Ramesses II. Okay, here, this scene also again is from the Egyptian Museum. And uh, you see, it's like a family scene. It's very unusual for the ancient Egyptians to be shown, and the royal families, to be shown in that family scene, eh? with the, the kids, the six girls they have, 
uh, and the, the father is kissing one of the girls. This is very, he, he never find it, but in the time of Akinas and Mufatiti. And uh, another daughter, she's like talking to her mother, a baby talking to her mother, and she's pointing the father and her sister as if she's jealous. Why they are doing so? I want to, to kiss my father as well. I want to be kissed. I want him to carry me like carrying the daughter as well. It's a beautiful love scene between uh, that famous king and his beloved wife. And you can see also on the top of the scene uh, the new form of the god being worshipped or invented by or introduced by Akhenaten, the god Atom. Uh, by the way, to touch, touch quickly this subject, that they haven't worshipped the sun god for a change, but they said oh, we're worshipping the hidden power of the god behind the solar disk. And it was a challenge. If you really want to look and see the god, you have to go uh, to, to see through the solar disk. If you can do so, then you can see the god behind. It's a challenge. Who can see through the solar disk? So the, 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 the god Atom is presented in the form of a solar desk and the sun rays coming out in by human hands holding the keys of life pointing keys of life to the nose of the king and the queen okay of course that was a famous couple son of a famous couple and they were the parents of a very famous king hmm? to thank him Tutankhamun, by the way, his name was originally, originally his name was Tutankhamun, Atum. Atum, named after the god Atum. He was a boy, age of nine, when he became the pharaoh of, of Egypt. And uh, under the pressure of uh, the, the, the priest of Ammon, he had to change his name, change back the religion to the religion of Ammon, and, and became Tutankhamun, the well-known name uh, of the king, if we translate the name, it will be the living image of the god Ammon, originally the living image of the god Atom. So here was his wife in a hunting scene. Those scenes, actually these are modern drawings on papyrus, uh, uh, taken from the original scenes on um, uh, boxes and caskets and so on uh, in the Egyptian museum. Uh, so here we can see uh, his wife uh, like hand handling the arrows while he's uh, uh, doing the hunting in the marsh of the Delta in a beautiful love scene. And uh, this is amazing uh, uh, masterpiece in the Egyptian museum. This is actually uh, a decoration on the throne of Sudan County. Have you seen it? Yeah. Also, uh, you can easily find it in the museum if you go to the upper floor uh, among the collections of the camera, like halfway into the main corridor, you find in the middle the throne will displayed, and if you stand in front of, of the throne, you will 